Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch along with Jim Garrity of National Review, author of The Weed Agency. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. We've got good, bad, and crazy martinis for you today as usual. And Jim, let's start with the good martini, and that's that even some Democrats see that the border crisis could be the tipping point for where Americans simply just don't trust this president anymore. The president is going to Texas on Wednesday to fundraise, and according to the White House schedulers, uh, he is not planning any sort of trip to the border to try and see exactly what the The crisis situation is in that part of the country. That's not even sitting well with some Democrats, including Texas Democratic Congressman Henry Cuellar, who used the uh, Katrina moment terminology with Neil Cavuto yesterday on his Fox News Channel program. Well, I hope this doesn't uh, become uh, President Obama's Katrina's moment. Uh, You know, I'm sure that President Bush thought the same thing, that he could just look at everything from up in the sky, and uh, that he owned it for, for, for a long time. So I hope this uh, doesn't become uh, the Katrina moment for President Obama, saying that he doesn't need to come to the border. He should come down. Katrina moment, of course, is when people kind of lost faith in George W. Bush right before the midterm elections. Iraq played into that as well. And so a lot of folks are seeing parallels to Obama here. We don't want to see these sorts of problems get this bad, and that's the only reason Republicans potentially get control of the House and Senate. But uh, the fact that this is, could be a tipping point for that, there's at least a silver lining there. Yeah, I'm actually going to come at this from a slightly different angle, Greg. And first of all, so yesterday I retweeted John Fund's uh, article on NRO pointing out that Obama was going to Texas for three fundraisers, but wasn't going to stop by the border. And some snotty liberal on Twitter said, you know, if he did, you guys would be dismissing it as just a, just a photo op. And this is a snotty liberal on Twitter, uh, and usually not worth listening to. But I actually think that there's a little bit of a validity to that point, which is that ultimately, whether or not the president goes to the border is of much less significance than the policy decisions he makes in response to it. And so I, I, Steve Hayes was making this point on Fox News this morning that really, do the optics look bad for Obama to be skipping over this? Sure. Um, but the really big consequence is what what are our laws and are we even bothering to enforce our laws and what are we going to do about this tsunami of unattended kids coming across our border? And so actually, if Obama never visited the border, but he got the policy right, I'd actually feel better about it than if he went there and he hugged the kids and gave a speech and you know shook hands and you know patted the border patrol agents on the back and stuff like that. And this is a point that other folks like Con Carroll have made before this. Imagine, Greg, that the president tomorrow doesn't even need to go to Texas, doesn't need to go to, board, go, to go to the border from the Oval Office. He gives an address either in prime time or at any point during the day, and he says, either in you know, either multilingual or with, with subtitles at the bottom of the screen, the United States is not offering an amnesty or any of these rumored permisos to children who come across the border illegally. If you come here illegally, you cannot stay. And make sure that message gets broadcast around the world and to Central America. Wouldn't that make a pretty big impact, don't you think, Greg? You would hope so, as long as that's actually what's happening. Well, that's the thing. Even if if enforcement didn't really get stepped up, the fact that the President of the United States was contradicting the rumor mill and, and openly and loudly and boldly contradicting the rumor mill down in these countries, saying, oh, no, if you come to America, they'll let you stay as long as you're a kid. Um, it would, you'd think that might at least make some people say, wait a minute, maybe I don't want to do this. And by the way, there's now a rumor, at least going around, that there are 300,000 children and, and uh, folks coming from these countries who are currently in some state of their journey in Mexico. The scale of the problem so far of 50,000 to 60,000 kids is actually just a drop in the bucket compared to what's apparently coming our way. So in light of all that, you know, I actually am not that worried about it. Now, it's intriguing to see Democrats referring to this as Obama's Katrina. I'm really worried about the politics of this and really worried about him botching this. But I actually think we're kind of getting wrapped up too much in what, in his travel schedule, a little more on what the actual decisions are and what this administration is willing to do. Apparently, they want you know $2 billion dollars to aid with the handling and processing of these folks. As I proposed in the the morning jolt, I have no problem with this as long as the facilities to house these folks while they're waiting their hearings to see whether they can stay, whether they meet some sort of refugee status. Uh, I would like them built on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, Billionaire's Row in San Francisco, (laughs) 
in the district and perhaps my former uh, home of the People's Republic of Alexandria, Virginia, <laughs> the Hyde Park neighborhood of Chicago, where all of America's limousine liberals live, those advocating for a comprehensive immigration reform and some form of amnesty, I want the illegal immigrants in that community so they can see firsthand and this will no longer be such a faraway problem to them. I think they would really appreciate that, Jim, because they're always <laughs> they, their actions always match the rhetoric. You know that. It does. It does. It's the only <laughs> compassionate thing to do, right, Greg? <laughs> yes, they're the ones who care, so let, yeah. let them deal with it. On to the uh, second and bad martini now, and we had a horse race for the number two martini today, but uh, this is from uh, the Washington Examiner, Susan Ferriccio. Democrats on Capitol Hill are turning to last year's playbook in the fight over highway spending. On Monday, Senate Democrats used the word shut down 13 times to describe what would happen if Republicans don't support a compromise bill to pay for summer and fall road projects. This would mirror the government shutdown, said New York Democratic Senator Chuck Schumer. It would be a highway shutdown. Bipartisan talks are underway. Both parties want to actually get this done. They just disagree on how big it should be and and what exactly should be included inside of it. So it's not uh, quite the same type of lines being drawn in the sand as with the uh, budget showdown last fall. But, uh, Jim, just that terminology could be a problem uh, for Republicans, particularly if this doesn't get solved. It is. And I, like everyone else, am kind of frustrated by this this cycle of perpetual shutdown, perpetual fights over this. I also think that the Republicans have a very legitimate point to be made here about how the arguments in favor of this spending never change, no matter how much actually gets spent. It's always you hear the refrain of crumbling roads and bridges. Last week, Obama went to the key bridge and talked about, oh, we need to do. Now, if you'll recall, that was the justification for the stimulus. And the president for a while was bragging, this is the biggest expenditure on infrastructure and roads and bridges since the Eisenhower interstate highway system was built back in the 1950s. So you'd figure that would make a dent in the problem, right? You know, and then last year we spent $52 billion. And the year before that, we spent $52 billion. And we keep spending these massive amounts, and yet the diagnosis of the problem never changes. It starts making us think it's not actually a diagnosis of the problem. It's a diagnosis of the spending desires. A continuing, you know, example of what's called the Washington Monument Strategy, in which, you know, you pick up very high-profile examples. And we've probably all seen the very familiar B-roll footage of crumbling overpass towers that, that the networks run whenever they discuss this, these matters. And it's just kind of infuriating to say, all right, well, if we spent $52 billion, why didn't that make an improvement in the problem that we did last year? Is money going where it needs to go, or is it ending up just burning down rat holes? I believe the phrase was, it turns out there wasn't as many shovel-ready jobs as... There you go. We thought there were. So <laughs> yes. uh, maybe apparently they're ready now, Jim. I don't know. It only took six years, right, Greg? <laughs> if that, yeah, we'll see. But uh, that that is uh, interesting to see. And my guess is something will probably get done this month. But uh, if it doesn't, uh, expect that to be in a lot of Democratic ads later this year. Speaking of campaigning, we thought we had seen the last of Mitt Romney as a presidential candidate. And most people still think we have. But this is from... Politico today, at least one House Republican thinks Mitt Romney will make another run for the White House in 2016. And this time, he says, the 2012 runner-up will emerge victorious. Uh, Jason Chaffetz was talking to Chris Matthews on Hardball Monday. I think he actually is going to run for president. He probably doesn't want me to say that, said Chaffetz. A hundred times, he says he's not, but Mitt Romney has always accomplished what he set out to do. I think he's proven right on a lot of stuff. I happen to be in the camp that thinks he's actually going to run, and I think he will be the next president of the United States. And Jim, uh, getting the nomination twice after uh, after losing once is usually not something Republicans are going to be uh, wanting to do. And I don't think the base of the party is ready for Mitt Romney part two. Governor Romney, if you're listening, and I'm sure you are, um, <laughs> we like you. I, for one, really like you. You're a good man. You were the better choice in 2012. And the country would be better off if you were president today. Having said that, you should not waste another big chunk of your personal fortune or your children's inheritance or the donations of your network of close friends and supporters on another bid simply because it's time to give another Republican a chance. Wherever you sit on the spectrum, I think we have a pretty darn good crop of candidates coming along, whether you like Rand Paul or Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio or Bobby Jindal. Rick Perry is talking about another bid. I know there's some folks who are still pulling for uh, Christie or, or Jeb Bush. Scott Walker. I'm, I'm probably forgetting a bunch, but we have, we have a good slew of people who I think deserve their chance on the national stage and to, to make their case for conservative governance and Republican policies. And 
Governor Romney, you deserve to win. You gave it your best shot and it just wasn't enough in a, in a tough environment. Please don't suck up the money and time and the airwaves and energy and volunteers and resources from a bid that I think is unlikely to succeed, even though you probably would have made a fine president and would, would still make a fine president. He's also getting up there in years. You got to wonder if you'd be up for a uh, potential two-term president. So Governor Romney, we, we love you. We want to see you in the, and Anne live happily ever after. Don't sink more money and time into another presidential bid. It's time to give somebody else a chance at the spotlight. I'm Jim Garrity, and I approve this message. <laughs> Good point on the age front. I think he and Hillary would be roughly the same age, which is, means both pushing 70 come 2016. So uh, that would be Yeah, it. he looks better, which says something about clean living, I think. <laughs> Nicely done. Jim, have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And join us again on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.